So President Biden uh, came out, gave a speech on Russia and Ukraine, and um, he is officially retaliating. He's going to do sanctions. We have our first set of sanctions that uh, he talks about here. So I want to take a look at the most important parts of his speech, and then I'll break down what I think he gets right, uh, what he gets wrong, what he could have done differently, how, uh, how good the policy reaction is. Let's take a look. Yesterday, Vladimir Putin recognized two regions of Ukraine as independent states. And he bizarrely asserted that these regions are no longer part of Ukraine and their sovereign territory. To put it simply, Russia just announced that it is carving out a big chunk of Ukraine. Last night, Putin authorized Russian forces to deploy into the region, these regions. Today, he asserted that these regions are actually extend deeper than the two areas he recognized, claiming large areas currently under the jurisdiction of the Ukraine government. He's setting up a rationale to take more territory by force, in my view. And if we listened to his speech last night, and many of you did, I know, he's, uh, he's setting up a rationale to go much further. This is the beginning of a Russian invasion of Ukraine, as he indicated and asked permission to be able to do from his Duma. So let's begin to, uh, so I, I'm going to begin to impose sanctions in response far beyond the steps we and our allies and partners implemented in 2014. And if Russia goes further with this invasion, we stand prepared to go further as with sanctions. Who in the Lord's name does Putin think gives him the right to declare new so-called countries on territory that belong to his neighbors? This is a flagrant violation of international law and demands a firm response from the international community. So today, I'm announcing the first tranche of sanctions to impose costs on Russia in response to their actions yesterday. These have been closely coordinated with our allies and partners, and will continue to escalate sanctions if Russia escalates. We're implementing full blocking sanctions on two large Russian financial institutions, VEB and their military bank. We're implementing comprehensive sanctions on Russian sovereign debt. That means we've cut off Russia's government from Western financing. It can no longer raise money from the West and cannot trade in its new debt on our markets or European markets either. Starting tomorrow and continuing in the days ahead, we'll also impose sanctions on Russia's elites and their family members. They share in the corrupt gains of the Kremlin policies and should share in the pain as well. And because of Russia's actions, we've worked with Germany to ensure Nord Stream 2 will not, as I promised, will not move forward. As Russia contemplates its next move, we have our next move prepared as well. Russia will pay an even steeper price if it continues its aggression, including additional sanctions. The United States will continue to provide defensive assistance to Ukraine in the meantime, and will continue to reinforce and reassure our NATO allies. Today, in response to Russia's admission that it will not withdraw its forces from Belarus, I have authorized additional movements of U.S. forces and equipment already stationed in Europe to strengthen our Baltic allies, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Let me be clear, these are totally defensive moves on our part. We have no intention of fighting Russia. We want to send an unmistakable message, though, that the United States, together with our allies, will defend every inch of NATO territory and abide by the commitments we made to NATO. We still believe that Russia is poised to go much further in launching a massive military attack against Ukraine. Hope I'm wrong about that. Hope we're wrong about that. But Russia has only escalated its threat against the rest of Ukrainian territory, including major cities and including the capital city of Kyiv. There are, there are still well over 150,000 Russian troops surrounding Ukraine. And as I said, Russian forces remain positioned in Belarus to attack Ukraine from the north, including warplanes and offensive missile systems. Russia's moved troops closer to Ukraine's border with Russia. Russia's naval vessels are maneuvering in the Black Sea to Ukraine's south, including amphibious assault ships, missile cruisers, and submarines. None of us, none of us should be fooled. None of us will be fooled. There is no justification. Further Russian assault in Ukraine remains a severe threat in the days ahead. And if Russia proceeds, it is Russia and Russia alone that bears the responsibility. So the tricky line that Biden had to walk here was deterring without escalating, which is difficult. And so you have to respond in a way that's uh, proportional. And I think he kind of succeeded on that front. It wasn't easy. I think he threaded that needle. Now, I'm going to tell you in a second uh, what I think he misses in the speech, what would have been an important thing to say and a necessary thing to say. But uh, just to run through it real quick. So they're going to sanction two banks. They're cutting off Russia from financing their debt on Western markets. Uh, they're rolling out sanctions on oligarchs. It was announced previously, and I, I believe this, I'm sure Biden had something to do with it, with phone calls and whatnot behind the scenes to Germany, but Germany is axing the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Um, 
And then, of course, he says we're going to defend we- we're going to send uh, weapons to Ukraine. He stresses, look, these are defensive weapons. Um, of course, the, the, the nuance there is, for the love of God, kick the Azov Battalion out of the Ukrainian military. The Azov Battalion are like card-carrying neo-Nazis. Can't have U.S. weapons going to neo-Nazis. But in all seriousness, I don't think the U.S. really cares that much. I think, because we've previously armed them and funded them, and then there was a brief period where we cut it off because Congress took action, and then when nobody was looking, we started arming them again. So I don't think they care, but I think that's colossally important that you cut off arms going to neo-Nazis. Um, but here's what Biden didn't do. Uh, and this says a lot. He didn't do, he didn't go all in on banking sanctions. He could have sanctioned way more than just these two banks. Apparently, um, what some experts are saying is the two banks that he sanctioned, it's almost a little bit like window dressing. There, He could have sanctioned more powerful and important and widely used banks in Russia. He didn't do that. And he didn't do the 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 SWIFT sanctions, which are, you know, like cutting Russia off from the global banking system. So he's got a lot more in the tank. He's got a lot more in the tank. And this is just, you know, the first round. And what happens next will depend on what Vladimir Putin does. Um, <clears throat> now, again, I'm going to get to what Biden could have done differently and should have done differently in a second. But before I do that, I want to show this uh, next graphic to you. So let me throw this up on screen here. This is from the Financial Times in Europe. Why did Putin recognize the independence of two breakaway regions in eastern Ukraine? Now, the reason why I'm showing you this, look at the map there. So on the on the right, that red portion, reddish portion, that's the area currently held by uh, separatist Russian forces or, you know, ethnically Russian Ukrainians who are separatists from Ukraine. They hold that region. Now, the historical region of Luhansk and Donetsk, which Putin just declared, oh, these are now independent republics. Um, it actually includes the rest of the beige area there as well. So, in other words, this is, uh, Putin set it up for a fight, because he's not saying, hey, just the separatist regions that the separatists already control are their own uh, countries now, their own republics now. Uh, he's saying, no, this whole area, even the beige area, is the republics of D Donetsk and Luhansk, but the issue here is, in the beige area, the Ukrainian military still controls that territory. So, it is set up for conflict, which means that at the very least, uh, Putin has a, a goal of clearing that territory of the Ukrainian military and making it uh, part of the separatist region. But beyond that, he also has troops uh, you know, stationed in Belarus and elsewhere, which is like kind of encircling almost all of Ukraine. So he's clearly got uh, some more expansionist goals in mind here. Now, what could Biden have done differently? What Biden could have done, I actually, most of the speech I actually agree with. Again, I think it was, uh, I think the response was proportional. It deterred without escalating. Um, the sanctions package he proposed is one I can definitely support, specifically because I, I don't think it's going to hurt Russian civilians. If they're sanctioned, like the swift banking san sanctions would definitely hurt Russian civilians. Um, I don't think it's going to hurt them. A and if it, if it ends up hurting them, in an egregious way, I will definitely flip and say, look, that wasn't the right plan. You have to find a way to go after the corrupt government officials and the aggressors without going after the population of Russia. Um, but what he could have done differently and what he should have done is everything in the speech exactly the same, but just add this one line. NATO is not, not part, or excuse me, Ukraine is not part of NATO and it never will be. Now, why would you say that? Well, for the very simple reason, Zelensky already came out and said, our NATO bid has stalled, and it's basically a dream for us to join NATO. So Zelensky's admitting, like, look, we're, we, we can't really get into NATO. So Zelensky came out and said that. That alone should have been more of a deterrent for Putin. Now, it wasn't, okay? But if Biden comes out and says, Ukraine is not part of NATO and never will be, what happens? What happens is, Number one, you're acknowledging reality. Number two, you just took away Putin's nominal, stress on the word nominal here, biggest grievance. So you go out there and say, look, you say this is the main thing you care about. Okay, well, we fully concede. Ukraine is not going to be part of NATO. Now then what happens? Then all the pressure flips onto Putin. 
You just gave him the thing that he said he cares about the most. If he continues to invade, well, then the U.S. gets to rally the entire world to our side. All of NATO will be unified against what Russia just did. But beyond that, you've even now forced the hand of India and Russia, who are sort of, you know, semi-allies, or excuse me, you force the hand of India and China, who are semi-allies with Russia. And so, because their, their statements at the United Nations on this were like, sort of wishy-washy and vague and, and broad and very clearly trying to like split the difference. But if you go out there and say, Ukraine's not joining NATO and it never will be, then you force the hand of India and China to even line up on your side and against Vladimir Putin. Because by the way, if you say that, and then Vladimir Putin does continue to invade, well, then what? Then you know that his main concern indeed wasn't Ukraine joining NATO, that there are other grievances that he has. So, and that's an important point, and everybody needs to understand this. And don't take my word for it. I want you to, you know, look into this yourself so you know that this is the reality. I watched the entire Vladimir Putin speech, and half of the speech was, you know, NATO expansionism, Russia's under threat, and, you know, we can't, we can't abide that. We just can't, uh, how would America feel if the roles were reversed and we were on their border, et cetera, et cetera. Now that stuff, look, there's agree or disagree with Putin, like or dislike Putin, that's fair. Like, we can see the logic in that. But the other half of the speech, in fact, it was the first half of the speech, was Vladimir Putin with a laundry list of other grievances against Ukraine. And to sum it up for everybody, it goes something like this. Um, we built you up. We funded you. You're in a colossal amount of debt to us. We made you what you are. My stupid predecessors uh, had you as part of the Soviet Union and gave you free reign to walk out whenever you wanted with, with no consequences. Um, we, we share a culture that, again, we helped build with you, and then now you turn your back on us. And now you're aligning with the West. And I, I, can't, I can't stand for that. So now hold on. That has nothing to do with NATO. That's a laundry list of other grievances, where basically Vladimir Putin feels entitled to either all of Ukraine or part of Ukraine. And he kind of gives the game away there, because, I mean, he just kind of talks as if he has imperial ambitions. As if he feels like, my predecessors messed it up, the Soviet Union got stuff wrong, I want to uh, correct the, the ills, the wrongs of the Soviet Union, and sort of reestablish a, a new Russian empire where we don't make the same mistakes. Okay, so, look, I, I think it's the reality, but if you now just give Vladimir Putin the thing he says on NATO, okay, Ukraine's not going to be part of NATO, you got it, we're announcing it, it's official. What now? What's Putin going to do? I think it's a 65 or 70% chance he still invades Ukraine. And then the U.S. gets to turn around to the rest of the world and say, see, we gave him what he wanted and he still was invading. That is Russian aggression. That is Russian imperialism. You know, it, he's the problem. He's the one being a warmonger here. And look, in the, whatever, 30% chance that he hears this, and he spins it as a win to the Russian public and then withdraws, okay, then that's another huge win. That <laughs> Then it's like, great, we would want that. And then we'd also know it was more about um, NATO than anything else. Now, the reason why I, I now think it's, it's not just about NATO and not mostly about NATO is, again, because Zelensky came out and said, it's stalled and it's a, it's a dream for us to get in there. So that's Zelensky saying, we're not really going to be part of NATO, and Putin's still invading anyway. So, look, I think all this stuff is really important. Now, I will say this, because some people will hear what I'm saying now, and they'll say, well, hold on. Who the hell is the U.S. to say, you know, if Ukraine wants to join NATO, shouldn't they be able to join NATO? Who the hell is the U.S. to say um, that uh, they can't join or to, to cut this deal in the first place? Well, there's a couple responses to that. Number one is, yes, yeah, step one is, do you want to join NATO to become part of NATO? Yes. But step two is, do the other NATO members agree? And according to Zelensky, there are multiple other NATO members who don't want Ukraine in. So even if they pass step one, they don't pass step two. And you don't just get to, you know, magically say step two doesn't count, and I don't like it. That's just the way that it works. And the way it works right now, they're simply not going to get in there. Um, and then, look, the other thing is, 
I'm sympathetic to the idea of like they, people should democratically be able to choose. But if we're going to use that logic objectively, then you also need to say people in eastern Ukraine need to democratically choose whether or not they want to be part of Ukraine or be independent or be part of Russia. And I got bad news for you. If you leave that up to a democratic vote in eastern Ukraine, they would probably vote to be with Russia. So if you're going to use this, well, the, the democratic approach is the only thing that matters in this geopolitical complex situation. Well, then you have to take that position as well. That, okay, maybe Eastern Ukraine does go and be part of Russia. Now, my guess is a lot of the people who criticize my statement on NATO would, you know, flip their standard when it comes to um, Eastern Ukraine being part of Russia. And then, of course, the, the most obvious point is if Mexico and Canada joined a Russian anti-U.S. military alliance, would our leaders tolerate it? No, they would flip out. And of course they would say this is an act of aggression. Duh. <laughs> of course they would. In fact, we know that. We don't need to speculate because if you look at the Cuban Missile Crisis, it's a very similar situation. That's what happened when Russia put their weapons in Cuba. We flipped out and the whole world almost got destroyed as a result of that. So overall, I like Biden's response. Um, it's a proportional response. He's deterring without escalating, in my opinion. Um, but if he added that line about NATO and said, Ukraine is not part of NATO and never will be, well then, I mean, it's almost like a checkmate of the Russian government if you do that. Because if Putin continues to invade, you get to turn around to the rest of the world and say, it wasn't even about NATO. See, he's just the aggressor. He was going to do this anyway. And if he doesn't invade, it's great. He didn't invade. That's exactly what we want. Him not to invade. He pulled out. So, and again, again, you rally the rest of the world to your side. So I think that mostly good, but the fact that he's missing that last part does lead to the reality that even with responding properly, there might be further escalation now on the Russian side. I mean, my guess is, my guess is that he's got tricks up his sleeve, that Putin has got tricks up his sleeve, that he prepared for this in the long term. So he knew these sanctions were coming. He probably thought worse sanctions were coming and he has contingency plans. And also got to keep it real. Biden even said this in a speech. There are going to be other consequences as a result of this. So namely, Russia provides 10% of the world's natural gas. Well, gas prices are going to rise. You know, uh, I think Russia provides 60% of German natural gas. Well, you know, I'm sure we're going to try to make up that difference and give our natural gas to Germany. But prices are still probably going to rise because even if we ramp up production, the supply is going to be shorter because now you're using it in a variety of different places. And so the prices are going to go up even more. And understand that with Saudi Arabia, there's already a problem. Biden and Saudi Arabia are not getting along for a variety of reasons. So Saudi Arabia is trying to keep the, the gas prices high at the pump to squeeze out Biden and make sure he loses in the next election. So with Saudi being stingy with it, and now with the, the crisis with Russia, gas prices are probably going to go up more. So anyway, uh, that's the gist of it. It's a really bad scenario. It's a really bad situation. Um, I'm scared of a tit-for-tat escalation that gets out of control and can at some point lead to direct conflict between the U.S. and Russia, which, make no mistake about it, is World War III. We really can't afford to flirt with nuclear annihilation. That should go without saying. All things considered, his response was decent, but the fact that he didn't say the thing about NATO and didn't concede on the obvious point means... Uh, the U.S. government, in many respects, is just bullheaded and stupid because you had an opportunity to checkmate him. And you even could have done, you even could have said, uh, Ukraine is not part of NATO and never will be part of NATO, and we're going to give Russia, you know, three days now to get out of Ukraine. Because, hey, we're giving you exactly what you want, so now you're going to have three days to get out. If you don't get out, then we're going to drop the sanctions hammer on you. Could have done that. And again, would have rallied the world to our side, would have been an obvious checkmate, it would have been able to prove what Putin's main motivation is, and then we could have gone on knowing, but he, they didn't do that. Um, overall, a decent response, but missed a very crucial and important part, which we may end up paying the consequences for. Hey, y'all, do me a favor and like and subscribe. It helps out big time in the algorithm. Click the bell as well for notifications when videos drop, and watch that video on screen right now. You know you want to.